Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Schedule. I got a little. Okay, my name is Dennis Gannon, and this is a uh, joint work with uh, my colleague Beth Playley, who is just over here sitting down. Uh, actually, it's joint work with a whole bunch of people. It's about a hundred people. Uh, actually, is a hundred people from a bunch of universities. Uh, the, the lead of the project is Kelvin Druggemeyer at the University of Oklahoma, and this has got a whole bunch of different experts in a lot of different areas, and uh, um, after years of kissing a lot of frogs, we've, this, this has really worked out really well. It's an exciting project. And what, so what is it? This is a project to understand, uh, to change the paradigm for research in mesoscale meteorology. So what is mesoscale weather? It's uh, tornadoes, it's hurricanes, it is really horrible things that happen very quickly uh, without a lot of warning and they're very hard to predict. And they are, as, as you may have noticed, those of us in the States, we've been sort of living in a sea of news about mesoscale meteorology uh, for the last uh, month or so. Uh, but uh, those of us from the Midwest know that uh, this is every year is a big problem. Uh, particular uh, tornadoes are even more difficult to predict than hurricanes, and the hurricanes even generate tornadoes. Uh, really complicated stuff. Now, here's the problem: uh, that in traditional meteorology, uh, they have a way of doing things, and it's just not cutting it. These are desperate people. They they want to be able to make predictions of a storm that are so accurate that people will believe the predictions. This is a big, serious problem. People say, ah, you know, they say the storm's coming, but I don't know, I'll stay here. Uh, if, if people would have faith in the predictions that are made, if the science were that good, and the policymakers had access to the right information, lives could be saved. But the problem with the current meteorology mechanisms is it, is it, is it's, it's a very, very linear process. You have static observations, which are done on a regular basis, go through data simulation, do some, some large-scale computation, get a result, and predict something. It's a very static chain of events. Uh, it's, it's entirely serial and pre-scheduled. And in particular, to, in order to change the paradigm, this pre-scheduled nature of, of the computation is not good enough for us to be able to make the truly precise measurements, on-the-fly decisions that we have to make. So what is really important is we have to be, as I'll explain here, we have to, be, we have to introduce adaptivity in the whole computational model. We have to be adaptive in response to the way we deal with the data. Storms happen. You can't, you, you, once you detect something is happening, that's when you should start triggering interesting computations. You also have to, as you see in a second, close the loop with instruments. And I'll explain what that means in a minute. You have to be able to be very adaptive in the way you use computational resources, too, because things change and storms happen, and you need more resources than you might have otherwise thought you did. And in particular, you have to rethink the, the whole data deluge. We call it the data deluge as opposed to the data avalanche. Uh, one is being buried, and the other one is drowning. Same bad news both ways. Um, so here's this, this notion of the, 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 the fixed current way of doing things in, adaptive, in, in weather prediction. You have a big, giant grid that is completely static, that has rectangles that sort of encompass, you know, like in New England area, four or five states in one grid cell. That just is not going to give you really accurate information. What they're going to now, and what these researchers are now capable of, is truly dynamic computations that will take a look at weather patterns and take different regions and based on the, what's happening in the weather at a particular time, focus the computation more intensely in that area with adaptive grids. And furthermore, these grids, as the weather changes, whoops, excuse me, as the weather changes, the grids themselves should change. 
So this, is a ver this type of adaptivity of the computation, focusing the computational effort on the area of interest, is, has implications in the way you use the computational resources. Because it, it changes dynamically the, the, the usage pattern. And I'll say some more about that later. The next thing that is really interesting is the current radars that are out there are also uh, have some new capabilities. These new next generation uh, Doppler radars are actually can be adaptive themselves. That you can dynamically steer them. You say something is interesting going on over there, refocus and give me more data about that spot and not so much over there where nothing is happening. This is very important. So the vision for this project then is to this closing of the loop between the observation, the data analysis, where you do a lot of data mining and data assimilation, the actual prediction, which is the large scale computation simulation, and to use to close the loop whereby a large scale computation, so here's the scenario, let me back up. The scenario is you have, you have some instruments feeding data to say a data miner. The data miner detects something interesting going on in the weather. It says, I see a pattern here. The pattern from the data miner then triggers some computation which starts up a set of simulations, a whole collection, we call them ensemble forecasts, of possibilities for what could happen in this area where something is detected. You use that data to feed back to the simulations uh, as the weather is evolving, you see what's interesting, and then if things really get interesting, you have the simulations tell the instruments on the ground to refocus their attention. That closing of the loop with the instruments is what these guys would really love to do. Can't do it yet, but that's where this project needs to go. It's a really hard problem. So, to reach this goal, we've, we, we, one of the things, here's what we've discovered along the way. Actually, my colleague Beth realized this long before I did. I sort of got hit over the head with this because I'm a compute guy, and now I realize the real, the real challenge is understanding the role of the data. And, and Beth will give another talk about a whole bunch of data issues tomorrow, so I, I'm not going to say a lot about that. But the data comes from streams, from mining, simulations, and visualizations. We've got to enable discovery because in order to do this sort of work, the scientists that are trying to build these sort of adaptive scenario, scenario, scenarios they need to be able to understand the role of the experiments. They, they, they conduct e-science experiments. They do it all the time. They analyze data, they reanalyze data, they try different scenarios, different workflows. They, they, they need, we need to enable that. Um, we also have to create sort of an educational context because it's an NSF project. That our plan is that anybody, students, you know, high school students, college students, uh, should be able to interact with the weather, is what Kelvin keeps saying. I interact by the weather by going outside, but they want students to be able to actually get onto this system and be able to try out scenarios themselves to really understand the weather. So to do all of this, what we've realized early on is we really need this agile architecture of composable services in order to really make things dynamic, to be able to put things together in different ways. And that our data is very distributed. It comes from instruments all over the place, radar instruments, all, uh, ground sensing instruments, um, uh, balloon instruments, commercial aircraft. All this stuff comes together. And it's very distributed. And the computational resources, in order to do the computing we want to do, we have to t use the TerraGrid, which is very big distributed uh, computational resource. All that says is that basically all the standard grid stuff applies here. Uh, distributed resource allocation, robust, scalable services, and security, it's all important. So, and the access to this, because of the educational requirements, should be very easy. So this is the architecture. Now this is, I'm not going to try to go into this in any detail, but, but the way we see this evolving is the, the, the grid world is building a whole set of services out there. That if they can get these services built in a standard way, we can, we can use them. Right now, some of these services are available. Some of the data services are available from the grid world, security services, information services, um, a little bit of job management. But for the application layer, you need, you need a lot of service. Not a lot, actually. Only about five different services are required to actually manage things, uh, to manage the computations and the data. And these, these are services that sit above these core services. We call them gateway services. 
and I'll be describing what some of these are. It's all controlled from this portal. Now, to give you an idea of what the, and the portal is the gateway. It's the entry point for this scientist. And in our case, this lead portal allows a scientist to log in. Actually, when they come to it, they see the weather. They can log in. They can see the computational resources. They have access to standard visualization tools. They have access to workflow tools as well, and I'll talk a little bit about all of those. But as soon as they log in, and this is very important, what they see is data. They see their data. They see all the experiments they've run. And this is something that Beth will say more about, might say more about it later, but it is really central to everything we do in LEAD. You log in, you see your data space. You see a history of all the computations. You see this is sort of a browsable interface to something that's really query-based. And once you start drilling down in this, you start to look at one experiment, you start to see everything about that experiment. And this is very important. You see a complete provenance of all the actions that took place in that experiment, and you can recover each individual step if you want and reuse it. And I'll say more about that in a second. Whoops. So now, how do we, how do we compose these services to really build applications? And so this is where the, the, the workflow part of this comes in, is that all, everything we have is data-driven. Okay? And so we have to be able to, the weather is a lot of stream information. And that really defines the nature of the computation. It's got to be very persistent and agile. We might start a workflow that is, that is designed to be able to process a certain type of tornado in a certain event. And, and it may sit for weeks or months without being triggered. So it's got to be a very persistent workflow, uh, but waiting to be triggered, waiting to be enacted. Um, and then it's also got to be adaptive, because guess what? The weather changes. The nature of the workflow may have to change on the fly. There's kind of an interesting research problem there from a CS perspective. And that the, the, the weather guys say, but we might have a workflow and it might start running and then the weather might change in a really weird way and then we gotta change the workflow. And so, okay, that's very hard, but interesting. And resources come and go. And so you have to be very adaptive there too. So the way we do this is we, we, we like to, we're building on, on standards as much as possible. Everything is a web service here. Our applications are, are, are set up as web services. The uh, resource brokers are web services. The workflow itself is a web service. And we're building on uh, basically Beeple, which is the standard that, uh, for web service workflow. And uh, actually, we, we're just now getting the Beeple stuff deployed. We have a grid version of Beeple called Jeeple and uh, that takes advantage of, uh, you know, just been slightly modified from Beeple to take advantage of a lot of the notification stuff that we're doing, which I'll explain. We also have a simple Python script version of the workflow, which is a sort of a temporary thing. But the idea is that once you start a workflow, the workflow then starts running or waits to run, once it's triggered, it starts interacting with the, the services. The services are applications. And we have something called an application factory, which the workflow talks to to create an instance of an application. Now I'll, I'll describe in a second what these applications are, but these are the raw components of the workflow. Now another very important thing that I'm going to point out is we have a notion of events that is part of this. And that is a really another core. The stuff in blue are the persistent services that are really important for us. And in eventing, we use WS eventing as our main channel for all information that flows around our distributed system. Now, about what applications are. So here's some of these application services. And what we get from the scientists are big Fortran codes or big C codes. And we could tell them, now, would you please rewrite these with the following computer science distributed systems principles in mind? Forget it. They won't do that. They can't afford to do that. So what you have to do is take their applications, and if you want them to use it in a way that is sort of composable, what we do is build a web service that is capable of executing that application. And it's a pretty simple idea, and actually it's been done by a number of different groups in different ways. But the types of applications, I don't know if you can read this, but the things like the, the, we have one web service that does the, it's called ADAS, generates 3D gridded analysis, takes all the input from, from different instruments and, and produces initial conditions for a simulation. Then we've got data converters of all sorts of types to convert from this 
ADAS form to something called WRF. WRF is their simulation model of the weather guys. This is their community code that they've developed. And so we have a WRF uh, service. And, and, so there, and there's a whole bunch more. There's maybe we've got about 40, 50 different services at this point, applications that we've wrapped up as services. And that's pretty easy to do. Um, then we have a tool which only a few a small number of people would actually use, the people that really understand how to compose these applications. Most users come in, they never see workflows. They see an application. An application could be just a workflow. They don't know it, but that's what it's doing. So they, everybody likes a drop and drag interface. I, I could give uh, atmospheric scientists Beeple. Those of you that know, everybody's seen Beeple here? I imagine, yeah, many of you have. You don't give that to a scientist, right? Uh, it's a bunch of XML craziness, and they say, no, 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 I just want this to connect to this to connect to this. So we wrote a little tool, because everybody likes this drop and drag thing, so there's no, nothing original about this. It's just a tool which allows them to, a little palette in the, in the that drop and drag this stuff. It's really a compiler. It generates people. And it just generates a small subset of people. So it's, it, it, and they like it a lot. So here's, for example, one of a, a, a workflow for a typical simulation for a weather condition. Now, this is actually a lot more complicated looking than it really is. Many of these boxes are just different types of data input. The boxes that, that have the sort of solid yellow in the middle are actual real computational components. And so they designed this. You know, they, they put this together. They said, yeah, that's it, that's it. And for them, this replaced like a 100,000 line Perl script that nobody could modify. Was it a hundred, something like that, Beth? Do you remember how big that script was? Big, 50, oh, okay, I, it doubled in my mind. I have 50,000 line Perl script. <laughs> but. It, they, they're really excited because now they have this and they can change it around easily. It's very nice. So here's, actually, here's an output from that, sim, that, that workflow that they did uh, for Katrina by taking, and this is typical of the experiments they do. This was done after Katrina had already hit, but they wanted to really, they have all the data, everything from Katrina, everything that led up to it. They know all about it. They know what happened to it. And so this is running that workflow I just showed you using the input data for Katrina. And then the workflow generates the output product, different types of visualizations. There's a 3D visualization package that the guys like to use, or standard 2D viz stuff. And so they can run it, they can analyze it, they can play it again, they can try different things in the simulation, they can change the workflow. That's the experimental process that they like. Oh yeah, how do we wrap up these, how's my time? I don't think I have time for this. 30 seconds. Anyway, we have wrap up these things as these, these legacy applications as services. It's really a pretty simple tool. You, basically, we have a tool that allows, an app, allows a scientist to describe the application uh, as an XML form. We're, we've got to make a web form for them to do it because they don't even like writing XML at all. But it's called a service map document. And we, you give that to our, our factory, and it just generates a service. It generates the whistle for it. It registers the whistle. It starts it up. That's my two-minute warning. So let's go on. Let's skip that. Skip that. Ah, this is really critical. All of our services spew out events. They, they, they keep track of everything they do, including when they fail. It's a great, important debugging tool for distributed systems because these services are running all over the place. So each one of them generates a notification. The workflow engine listens to these notifications. The data system, the metadata catalog, records all of these events. That's very important for being able to do replaying experiments. You can go back and you can see everything that happened. You can replay an experiment exactly with this by tracking the events. So here's an example. This is one that was done actually to test this up. This is a set of services that were written by our data mining colleagues at another university, and they put together, this is, uh, they're part of the project, and they put together a little workflow for doing the data mining feature extraction from some of the radar data. And it gives you an idea, here's, this thing is green there and yellow there. This is actually showing, you can watch the workflow in real time, although most workflows take so long to run, you don't want to do that, but it, a lot of them like that. But you can, you can use the tool to watch it. Here's the output of just from the first feature extraction service, the first chain of this workflow, it's being recorded in our metadata catalog, my lead it's called, 
uh, all of the data, all of these events. And so you see some of them are really, you know, um, it's just all the detail. It gives you everything about that thing. And, and furthermore, it can actually lead down to the last event is usually visualizations that you can click on and, and see them. So to conclude then, this lead project is great. It's got this amazing set of requirements. The architecture that we've come up with is really a result of these requirements. And it, it's like many of these other, I call them gateway architectures. It, it's a way to put some useful tools in the hands of a user that really underneath it all is a big distributed system. For a successful, the scientists will never see the distributed system. They don't want to see it. They want to just run the applications. They don't want to care where the data is stored. They want, they want access to it. They want to be able to search for it and discover it. Um, so we have this fusion of data management and workflow that's really been very interesting to see how that works. This adaptivity requirement is really making us rethink what a workflow should look like. And we haven't solved that problem yet because this whole problem of what? If I want to change the workflow or stop it and modify it, and we're, we don't know how to do that yet. But, but that's where we're, we're working hard with them. So that's, that's it. So I don't... Yes? Right. Do you anticipate that the adaptivity uh, aspect are going to change that? For example, like in bioscience, I understand that people really like putting into the workflow. Right. You know, it's a big deal in the sense of the concept of modifying experiences. Right. Some of that as well. So, what we see is that some of the, is that there's a group of the scientists that are the hardcore that are doing these experiments with adaptivity. These are the core meteorologists. And they want to be able to get in there and fiddle with the workflow, stop it, and, and change it while it's running. And they need to see all those tools. There's, there's another category of users that just, you know, they want to run standard workflow number 27 with three different, or four different data sets at different times with different parameter settings to see if they're really understanding the, the, the significance of, of certain parameters in the workflow. And so they don't want to change it, but they see it as an application. And they're not going to try to modify it on the fly, but if they need to, it's there. Each one of our, from our portal, you bring up this as an application. A workflow is just an application. You see an interface to plug in parameters, and then that instantiates the workflow. If I tell them, you're going to run a workflow, they don't even like to hear that. They just want to see an application. Right, does that answer your question, really? Okay. All right. Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we're looking at WS reliability is one thing we're doing. The other thing is is actually scalability because we've we've discovered actually that if you start running this at scale with the event densities that we have and having one little WS event channel sitting on a, on a, you know, a box someplace, uh, doesn't work. So we're really looking at, 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 the, at this whole scalability of, of, of the event model. We haven't, you know, we haven't really solved the problem yet. Right now, you know, I would say for the level of users we have, we haven't gone to a large scale user base, but we're going to have to, I've got actually a couple of students who I've told them their PhD project is going to be understand scalability and reliability of this sort of stuff. And they're out scouring the literature right now to figure out what it is that we, we don't know. Uh, because we're, we're, we're kind of scratching along you know, by our intuition here. There's not a lot of literature on how to scale eventing in reliability. Um, and you, you guys probably can tell me all sorts of good things about that. We're just sort of, that hit us on, over the head and, and we're working on it.